can go. Well, I think we'll start getting going. Um, welcome everyone here uh, to the PMC, and uh, just to uh, and welcome all of you watching online. Uh, just to say, my name is Mark Hallett. I'm the director of the Paul Mellon Centre, and it's a treat to have you here with us, both in person and virtually. Um, this event will be is being live streamed, as I say, and and it's also going to be recorded for a later release. And just to say, if you're watching online and would like to ask one of our speakers a question, you can do so by writing in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And a member of our team uh, will read out your questions at the appropriate time. And meanwhile, anyone, for anyone in the room here who wants to ask a question during our Q&A session, which will follow our discussion, please can you make sure you speak into the microphones we'll be handing out so, you can, so the audience at home can hear what's being said. And a quick safety notice, there are no planned fire drills this evening, so if the fire alarm does sound, please leave your belongings, or maybe take your coat quickly, uh, and evacuate the building. Your nearest fire exits are on the ground floor, through either of the front doors at the centre, and please assemble outside number 28, Bedford Square, to the right as you leave the building, uh, if we should all find ourselves gathered outside. So, we've enjoyed six really wonderful papers over the past couple of months, given by some of our most distinguished and promising historians of 18th and early 19th century British art. Over the next hour and a half or so, we'd like to reflect with you, both here in person and with each other, and of course with you online, upon the programme as a whole, to explore what it might suggest about the ways in which British art of the Georgian period is currently being defined and researched and thought about. And a reminder, each of our talks, and that's the conceit of the programme, focused on an individual work of art. All of our speakers were invited to, to talk about an individual work of art and to use it to open up broader questions and issues. And a quick reminder of the series as a whole and its richness. In our first talk, Paris Spice Gans used Liza Trotter's portrait of Lady Caroline Lamb, exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1811, to kickstart a fascinating discussion about the role, presence and practice of women artists at the Royal Academy in that period. Secondly, my colleague Martin Marone, sitting to my left here, explored the life and the extended continuing afterlife of Henry Fusley's The Nightmare, exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1782, and in doing so, troubled some of the more complacent ways in which the picture has traditionally been interpreted. Or trouble some of the ways in which it's been interpreted that can be understood as possibly rather complacent. Thirdly, Esther Chadwick, who sits here to my right, discussed two portraits by Richard Evans, exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1818, of Haitian King Christophe and his son, Prince Henry, and used them to think afresh about the representation of the black figure in the period, and about the ways in which the conventions of British portraiture or English portraiture could be turned to entirely new ends. In our fourth talk, Nick Robbins, who's sitting here too, moved away from the exhibition room. Interestingly, the first three talks focused on uh, exhibited pictures. Nick moved away from that arena to offer an extended and really fascinating meditation upon an astonishing series of drawings made in the 1790s, numbering some 500 in total by the artist George Romney, which depicted the prison reformer John Howard encountering a mass of suffering bodies in a dank, oppressive, penal environment. In our fifth lecture, Nika Elder uh, returned to the Royal Academy for her selection, rereading John Singleton Copley's remarkable Watson and the Shark, exhibited in 1778 as an allegory of inter imperial commerce and conflict. And last but not least, my colleague, my other Martin, my other colleague uh, called Martin, uh, <laughs> focused on a fast, Martin Postle, focused on a fascinating self portrait of Joseph Wright of Derby, and argued that it needs to be understood as a highly performative, experimental form of self display and redated to a moment in the 1760s when Wright's art was being appreciated for its novelty and innovation. So I'd like to begin and open things up by asking my panel, fellow panelists in turn really about what it was that made you choose the image you focused on in your talk. So I'll begin by a couple of us here in the room uh, and I will actually turn to the two Martins. So Martin Marone, first of all, oh, what uh, made you decide to choose The Nightmare? Yeah, okay. Well, um, firstly, there's almost a no-brainer in that The Nightmare is one of the most famous images of the 18th century, and it is a famous image in British art. And so insofar as the series as a whole is going to be revisiting um, works, which some of which may be familiar, some of which may be less familiar, there was a chance to Kind of revisit an icon, um, but it was the task of or the opportunity to revisit which appealed um, particularly because it's a painting which I've been in a fortunate position in as a scholar and as a curator um, uh, previously uh, to write about and think about and present and actually display um, 
for over 20 years. Uh, and I, I did a little book on Foosley uh, two decades ago, and I, and I was able to include the painting in an exhibition at the Tate in 2006. So um, there was the chance, as I say, to kind of revisit my own thinking about it um, and think and see, you know, go back to a painting which I know well and I've talked about and written about before and say, well, what do I think about it now? Knowing that there's a profound shift in perspective. Um, and that profound shift in perspective comes because of a number of circumstances. Um, some of it is personal, you know, hitting 50. I know it's, it's hard to believe, but, you know, turning 50 and that changes your perspective on life. Um, changing role right around the same time that I was a curator at the Tate for a long time and I was occupied in kind of curatorial roles, working with the collection and working with displays and exhibitions. And then I joined the Paul Menon Centre and worked with the British Arts um, Network. So my own position changed a great deal. And there's a chance to rethink, well, how do I think about art history? How do I think about curating? Having a bit of distance on the work that you do as a curator, but then also being being involved through the network and through the work here that we do here in kind of thinking about um, British art, thinking about British art history, thinking about British art studies more broadly. So that came into play. Uh, but then also, you know, if it's a work which you can see a sliver of it on the screen there, um, it's a work which is about sex, it's a work which is about violence, it's a work which is about taste and imagination and the way it was received in, in some quite challenging ways. Arguably, it's a painting about race. Um, and it's a painting by an artist who is part of British art history, but who was foreign. It was a Swiss artist um, or Swiss born. Um, and in all those regards, you can think, well, what you might say about the painting now may be different than what I was saying about it 20 years ago or 15 years ago in the light of you know, the, all the things which have happened over the last five, six, 10 years, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, uh, Brexit, um, and the whole kind of changing world of thinking about British art, thinking about British art history, but also thinking about culture, cultural values and social justice. And so it felt like an opportunity to revisit a work, which you know I know well, which is familiar to many people, but to start casting a new light on it and start kind of rethinking what we might say about a painting, which is so familiar and which has such a long um, and complex uh, reception history. Thanks very much. Martin Possel, can you talk a bit about what made you choose this particular picture by Wright of Derby? <clears throat> yes, well, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I was just speaking last week, so you might actually be able to remember my talk. Um, yeah, well, it, as I said at the time, and I, I repeat that now, it relates closely to my current research interests. I wanted to do something that I was really kind of enmeshed in. And this project is a catalogue raisonné of the oil paintings of Joseph Wright of Derby. Is an artist whom I've been familiar with for the best part of 40 years. And I've always admired, I've always found him one of the most fascinating and dare I say underrated of, of the major artists of the period, but I've never really gone in deep with Wright. So I wanted to do something that was part of my, very much part of my research world. That was very important to me, but rather than just light on something that I could talk about, you know, quite happily. Um, I think the second thing was that it, the picture itself had just entered a public collection. It had just been acquired and made by Derby Art Gallery. So it wasn't a picture that was very, very familiar to us. We'd seen it in illustrations in books and I knew it, but it makes a big difference when a picture comes into the limelight and lots of people can get to see it, appreciate it and get to understand it at first-hand basis, because I'm very much a believer in that art is a, is a first-hand kind of experience and confrontation. I went up to see it in May when it was launched. Um, and I was also interested because this particular acquisition tells us, or helped us understand the ways in which art, which has been in the private, transitions into the public. I talked a little bit about that at the time. It wasn't a case of, it wasn't simply a gift. It wasn't something simply they bought. It came through something called acceptance in lieu. And I wanted to talk about the way in which our artworks find their way into something we sometimes take for granted, but it's, it doesn't actually work like that. I also wanted to pick a work which was a key work in Wright's career. And I think I wanted to talk about this transformative period in Wright's career from the mid 1760s to the late 1760s. So this is before the Royal Academy is actually founded and put it in the context of some of his greatest achievements, those extraordinary, extraordinary nocturnes 
And I, I felt it was my hunch that this had to be somewhere in the firmament and had to be uh, related to it. And it helped me draw in some other works that he made during, the, I think he made during the period, these extraordinary uh, uh, chalk, black and white monochromes works on paper. And I wanted to think about the issues, which can sound rather mundane, about dating. Because sometimes with a work of art, we just accept as a ready-made, oh, it was painted in 1763, it was painted in 1768 or whatever. And that kind of gets stuck to it as a label, sometimes quite literally as a label. And then we start thinking about, the, you know, there was a moment when it didn't exist. And then there was a moment when it did exist. So I like to kind of imaginatively take myself back to that moment and put it in context. So I think it's also, as Mark said, it's a fascinating image relating to artistic self-perception and self-visualization. I think it's one of the great self-portraits of the 18th century. And then finally, to take us back to a picture that I might have talked about when we first discussed the series, I thought, well, I'm definitely going to talk about Wright of Derby. What is his greatest picture? It's, to my mind, and I think a lot of people agree, it's an experiment with an air pump, National Gallery. But I thought, let's go for something different. But of course, the the buy the you know the buy one get one free was on the reverse of the self portrait was the oil sketch for the experiment with an air pump. So it led me to think not only to discuss the two separately but how they might relate to one another. So there are a lot of there are a lot of different. It was a, it was a kind of multi sided kind of challenge, and I really enjoyed the time that I put into it. We can talk about when we talk about how we actually prepare talks and and the way in our methodologies about how we actually put things together. But it was a very enjoyable and kind of a genuinely refreshing exercise for me, and I hope for others too. Thank you. Can I now turn to our, we have two of our speakers, of course, are based in the US, and we are now going to ask them for their uh, responses to the same question. Maybe first, um, Paris, as you began, you kicked off our series. Can you tell us a bit about what made you choose that particular work, uh, the Trotter work, to launch your exploration of, uh, of, of women artists in, in the period. Yeah, exactly. Um, can you hear me first of all? That's this... fine, yeah. Great. I chose the Trotter work because I felt like it was perf really, really representative of the opportunities and challenges that we have in studying women artists from this period more broadly. Um, we know from exhibition catalogs that hundreds if not thousands of women were exhibiting their art at this time. A lot of them were trying to be professionals, they were listing their names, they were listing their addresses. We know that some of them were selling works or were trying to through different newspaper advertisements, but a lot of the details of what they were doing um, are only slow and co slowly coming to the surface. And a lot of it's simply unrecoverable. You know, with the current information we have, for instance, if we have a Miss Smith who exhibited a portrait of a lady in 1800, we can find a portrait of a lady, it can be signed Miss Smith, and we'll never know if that was actually the one she exhibited. And so what's great about the Trotter painting is that it was exhibited, we know it, it was exhibited as portrait of a lady, but because of the status of its sitter, we it survived with its kind of attribution and history intact. That said, although we know a lot about the sitter, it's Caroline Lamb, she was an aristocrat, she had a series of notorious affairs, including with Byron, we know very, very little about the artist. And so what this painting represents for me is all of the ways that we can open windows into what was happening for women artists in this period. And a lot of them are very oblique, and some of them are surprisingly direct. And one of the wonderful things about this prompt of choosing a painting and seeing where it can lead you, let me kind of use it as a launching pad into all these different directions of the ways we can recover, but more than that, you know, really study in depth what we do know and start to compile that information to recreate what was an incredibly vibrant and active world of women artists not working in isolation, but working alongside their male peers and kind of using all the markers and working to achieve all the markers that, you know, traditionally convey status um, and professionalism and that they would have, of which they would have been highly aware. And so the combined relative anonymity of all of the, of the artist and of the way the portrait was exhibited seemed perfectly symbolic for me. And then the really known quantity of 
having the painting survive and knowing so much about the sitter showed us how rich all of these works may have been and many of them likely were that don't survive and so it felt like it really um begins to scratch the surface and show what was there um and what may be recoverable thank you nika can you tell us a bit about watson and the shark and your sure. choice of that well, picture Sure. Uh, like Martin, I really wanted to work on something that was at the heart of my research right now. Um, and so that's work that's very much in progress. But I got to Watson and the Shark actually through Copley's early colonial portraits. So I'm an Americanist by training. And I started working on Copley looking at those early portraits that he did while he was still in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And going even further back, I got into that project because I had been researching the material culture of slavery. Um, and I noticed all of these fascinating objects and images that were circulating around the time that Copley was prominent um, in the colonies. And so I started thinking about his portraits in relation to the practice and institution of slavery there. Um, and the fascinating thing in that work was that he, at that time, had not depicted any people of color. So all of the portraits were of white sitters. Um, and every time that I was giving a talk on that material and was introduced in, as giving a talk on Copley and race, someone assumed that I was gonna be talking about Watson and the shark. Um, and so after I, kind of completed that phase of thinking through Copley's portraits, I thought, well, let me actually turn to Watson and the Shark and see how I might feel differently about that work, how we might be able to see it differently if we think about Copley's early work as having been invested in race too, despite, or in fact, because of the fact it was focusing on white sitters. Um, and then as I started working on Watson and the Shark, then uh, I was always being like congratulated for my chutzpah in taking up such an iconic painting within the American and British canon, um, which always was fascinating to me because I think I have started to really try to inhabit Copley's perspective on these works. And so in my mind, what's interesting about working on Watson and the Shark today, and the reason why I wanted to make it the focus um, of my talk was because I wanted to think through it before it was this iconic painting. When it was for Copley, his initial foray into history painting, when it was an experiment that he wasn't sure was gonna pan out. And when he was really trying to do his utmost to make it a painting that would have lasting resonance. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much both. Turning, returning to, uh... The room here maybe straight on to you esther if you could talk a bit about your choice of these two unusual and, ex and amazing portraits yeah, absolutely and thanks mark for this evening and hi everyone um so again like martin possel and like nika it's a kind of immediate answer is that this comes out of some research that i've been doing at the moment which is on um the aesthetics of henry christophe and his court in haiti more broadly and i've been writing about um, those of you who watched my lecture, that amazing, one of the amazing coins that was made by Thomas Wyon, showing Christoph as a Roman emperor um, that was sent to Haiti um, for, uh, at his behest. Um, and the, the two portraits that we looked at flash up in that work as kind of supplementary materials, but not the focus. So I, I wanted to use it as an opportunity to, to learn more about the portraits themselves. Um, because unlike the nightmare, say, they are deeply uncanonical. Um, and while they are known to historians of Haiti and um, various other, um, in, in other fields, they are really understudied in the history of British art and, and very much not on the British art radar. So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to show, shed some light on them, to share them with people that might not know them. Um, and um, um, to then think about what, knowing about them can tell us 
or shed new light on on other aspects of British art. So, which is why you know this thing about what do they, what does it tell us to see them next to Turner in, at the Royal Academy, and what does it, what does their presence there tell us about the Royal Academy as a as an exhibition space? But um, in a way, I think perhaps a more interesting answer to this is that I'm really compelled by the way that these works collide both the most traditional kinds of British art history and the kind of old canon of British art history, Van Dyck, Reynolds, Lawrence, the, the tradition of grand manor portraiture. They collide, like they force us to collide that history with um, you know, some of the most um, kind of critical work going on right now in the field of critical race in um, black history. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and the history of the Haitian Revolution. And what I'm interested in is art history that can bridge these things, that can both be attentive to our, you know, deeply inherited and, and well-honed um, history of British art that has been kind of generated over many decades and generations. Um, and what you might think of as more critical speculative history that has to happen, say, in the absence of traditional archives. Um, and, um, and it's that bridging that I think is very exciting and that, that I want to try and do and, and, and want to encourage my students to do. Thank you. And finally, Nick. Um, well, yes, and thank you, Mark, and thank you, everyone. Um, my story is sort of more um, contingent and personal in the sense that I've been uh, George Romney, the subject of the talk I gave, is, a, is an artist I've been interested in for a very long time. Um, and 15 years ago, somehow, I worked on a, sh a small show about a group portrait of him with William Haley that I started the talk with. Mm -hmm. And he's, Romney has just continued to kind of fascinate me. But I think to the, to the point about the kind of history of of British art history, I think it's interesting how he's an artist who sort of comes in and out of focus, an artist who at, in his time was extremely um, prominent, extremely well-known, um, extremely successful, and then, and then has, for various reasons, come back in and out of focus over time. So I think that's always interesting to consider why. Um, the works <clears throat> that I decided to actually talk about, though, uh, I chose partially being quite compelled by them. And it was actually an invitation from Esther a few years ago to uh, talk at a workshop for a project she's working on that made me return to them. Um, but the context was actually, um, you know, after the summer of 2020, when I was still living in the, in the United States and um, thinking a lot about the role of prisons in society, um, those works, uh, when I looked at them again, I thought, oh, actually, this could be a way for me to, to learn myself and to think about the history of, of um, the way the penitentiary, the way the prison has, has functioned in culture and what images do or don't offer us um, as a way of um, pressing back against some of those uh, formations. Mm -hmm. um, so that was how mm -hmm. I came to those. Thank you all very much indeed. Now, can I ask you all to reflect on what you think this particular set of talks tells us about the state of um, British art studies or the study of British art in this period at the moment and what reflections you might have about you look at the series as a whole and the kind of preoccupations of the series. What things do, does that shout out to you? We can go around in order, or we can we can maybe move around a bit more flexibly, but Martin, to start yeah, with you. I'm happy to jump in because I think there's two... two very simple observations that I'd make, and I've got some initial thoughts about that, but I'd also be interested to hear what other people think. Um, firstly is, I mean, these are, this is series, it's called Georgian Publications, series two, I think. Um, it's late Georgian. I don't think there was, was anybody talking about pre 1760 material. Mm -hmm. So there are like two whole Georges missing. Um, mm -hmm. And I looked at what uh, Georgian Publications series one, there was Hogarth, Richard Wilson, there was sort of, you know, it wasn't heavily early 18th century, mm. but this is very emphatically post 1760. And I don't know if that was deliberate in organizing this, or does it represent, well, this is where the work is happening. Mm. And if this, if this is where the work is happening, well, why might that be at this moment? And I think, I wonder if, if um, what makes late Georgian, late Georgian, if we call it that, obviously it's kind of old fashioned term, and it might be to do with things that were forming in the early 18th century, 
uh, whether we could think about it as a kind of cultural field or a system for the arts, are pretty firmly in place by the 1760s and beyond. You think about art exhibitions, think about art criticism and commentary, think about the Royal Academy, that's 1768, 69. You know, there's a kind of institutionalization um, and that work is done. It's almost like you can start looking at other things once, that, once the art world is formed in a particular way by the 1760s. So but I'd, be, but I'd be interested to know, you know what other people thought about that periodization. Um, the other thing is about genre, right? Where's the landscape? I think um, you had Richard Wilson in series one, probably wasn't a lot of landscape, mm. but actually if you think of where modern modern 18th century British art studies really took off and developed, became, you know, arguably a very exciting kind of field, it was with people working on landscape in the 80s and 90s. Landscape and property were so squarely at, in the, you know, at the focus for a long period. Um, including into a period when we, when our historians start to think about empire a bit more. I think of Diane Kretz, Kretz's book, which is kind of landscape based, or Jeff Quilly on 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 Hodges. Um, so where's the landscape gone? Mm. Okay. Any other thoughts from panelists about what the series has told you about where we are with British art studies right now of this period, or of the late Georgian period? Um. Well, I mean, again, a very simple, well, first of all, just to respond to you, Martin, I mean, it is interesting to what extent Georgian is a helpful descriptor for us here, because I imagine that 1818 and the Haitian Revolution doesn't feel very Georgian to lots of people that think about that material, you know, I mean, it is technically late Georgian art, and it's late Georgian context, but it's an interesting, you know, I think that that word Georgian has such particular resonances in the history of the study of British art and um is it a term that's useful to retain um it's it's a it's um it's a it's a nice thought it's an interesting thought um again a really simple observation about the the talks was just how wide the spectrum is between the most canonical works and very very obscure ones like Eliza Trotter's Caroline Lamb for example um and there's this again this interesting kind of duality or symbiosis between deep empirical study like the kind of study that um, Paris has been doing to just unearth the statistics and you know dig back up those names and figures um, from the academy catalogues and so on and Martin your work on you know redating like the basic problem of um have we got our dates right? You know, there's still big questions to ask about works that we thought that we knew those kind of nuts and bolts about. Mm -hmm. So there's the kind of empiricism, but then there's also these critical, social history of art critical frames. So race, gender, and so on, an interest in the poor and the marginalized and the, you know, the incarcerated in your case. Um, and so, I don't know, this is a question really for, 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 for you, um, everyone else. Is this just a kind of continuation of the seeds that were planted in the 1980s with the, the arrival of the new art history? Or is there, is there something new going on here? Are these dynamics ones that are simply kind of the, the late flowering of, of, of um, tensions or binaries or um, yeah, dynamics that, that, were, that, that have been established for a long time? Paris, do you want to respond to that quest, that provocation or question from, from Esther? Yeah, um, I think that's that's really interesting. And one one of the things that struck me was actually what you had said your goal was with your talk, which is to kind of address this collision of, you know, what's traditionally been studied with what you know else this period birthed and you know perpetuated. And that's one of the things I was most struck by in the talks was that even though um, a lot of them were really, I think, challenging the concept of Georgia and, you know, in a lot of traditional frameworks, everything was still kind of tied to these pillars of the ways that we study British art. And I found that fascinating, you know, that no one's really challenging, as far as I could tell, the, like, the basic infrastructure of the discipline, but they're changing the ways that it's applied and what it's looking at and, you know, what falls under it. But we're using the traditional tools. We're using a lot of the, um, and I don't mean traditional in a bad way. I mean it as it's so established that we, and we believe in it, you know, the value to such a degree. Um, 
that they've become pillars that allow for this incredibly wide ranging and diverse um, set of questions that people decided to pose for this series. Um, and in terms of the empiricism, what I can say for the study of gender is it kind of, it does go in these cycles where women or, you know, concepts of gender get attention and people kind of acknowledge that women artists existed or something like that. And then it goes away and then it comes back and it goes away. And so maybe this is rebirthing something from the eighties that was rebirthing something from the early seventies and it keeps going. Um, and each time maybe it raised, these artists get raised a little higher above the surface and there's a little more lasting power before they go away again. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But I think a lot of it actually has to do with at least the empiricism on my end, the ability to count and the ability to, because um, I've always said with my project, I don't think I could have done it before computers and the internet. I would have loved to have, but it would have taken three times the amount of time but being able to type up names, to have different categories, to cut and paste, to use Excel, let me come to, you know, learn in a way that I just wouldn't have been able to without these tools. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point for us all to acknowledge is the transformation <laughs> of, the of, of, of the kinds of work that we're doing thanks to the digital and, 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 the, and, and online resources. Nick, your thoughts on what this the series as a whole suggest to you about uh, where we are with the subject. Yeah, I mean, I think one maybe um, both um, sort of chiming with with Martin Myron's comment, I actually think of history painting as the kind of key um, object of study of 18th century um, British art. And maybe that's my misconception, but I actually found it very interesting how history painting kind of haunted, continues to haunt um, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing, even if it's in other genres, whether that's portraiture uh, or genre painting. Um, and I also thought it was really interesting, and maybe this is just what we do as art historians, but a lot of our papers were about these, um, <clears throat> trying to sort of think about ambition in this moment, late Georgian art. And also we've always thought of this moment as, as a kind of a very ambitious moment for British art, for kind of establishing various kinds of um, institutions or, um, ways of working. And I, I found it interesting that we were talking about sort of ambitious projects, both projects that sort of <laughs> succeeded, projects that failed, projects that succeeded in their time and yet have then receded from view. Um, and so I'm not sure if that, that is a direction the field is going in, but I found it interesting that a lot of, a lot of the talks centered on these kinds of gambits almost um, mm. of artists, the kind of wagers that they were, or, or patrons, both artists and patrons. And maybe just to sort of add just a, a footnote to that, I, I was curious, not in all of the talks so much, but certainly in your talk and in Martin Possel, and indeed, I think you, Martin, my own, um, this question of biography also kind of haunting a little bit, like what we do with the artist's biography. And it was fascinating in the questions, for example, that came up after your talk, how much people wanted to come back to Romney and Romney's biography and Romney's psyche and all of that. Mm -hmm. And that did seem to be something that was in the air for our, for much of what was being said, but not a thing that we were, you know, tackling head on by grabbing the bull by the horns. Um, so that's something to add. Yeah. Martin Possel. Oh, I the thought there. Yeah, that that word. Sorry, the microphone. That word collision that you brought up, I think, is is kind of key uh, in all this. That your portraits definitely didn't these two portraits that you explored uh whether whether they were consciously colliding or or, or not I, I don't know um but all the things that were chosen and selected were works which are uh, kind of gave a new edge to what was going on at the period and obviously i go back to, to write of derby we look back with the perspective you know the, the benefit and we've, we've constructed the history of british art reynolds games were right with wilson as often etc etc but at the time, these, what the exciting thing was, it was being made, and it was never determined where things were going to pan out, how they were going to pan out. And I don't think even Joseph Wright himself knew in 1763 he was going to produce these pictures. 
it was a catalyst and it was called Peter Perez Burdett and then his life changed and then all sorts of other things changed. And I think it's it's interesting that the, the works we, 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 we chose, I think I'm right in saying, I'm not sure how, sure how big Eliza Trotter is. They're not big, big pictures. You know, the nightmare's not a, a big picture physically. Mine's not a big picture. Yours definitely are. They look like full lengths, but they're not, which is something we were touching on before. They were drawings. So they're not things that were commanding massive spaces in public displays. They were important and, and they, they gained an importance. I'm always fascinated by the fact we talk about exhibitions and exhibitions are important and it was exhibited then, it was exhibited then and people saw it, but it was just for a fleeting moment. They saw it for a week and there was, sometimes there was no record. It just disappears and it goes back into a private collection like, like my portrait and it just vanishes. And even pictures like the experiment with an air pump and the orrery by right, they disappeared too. And so, yes, there were mezzotints, yes, there were records. And so I'm fascinated by, you know, we are, things have changed. Digital, absolutely. I couldn't have done any of this uh, without the digital revolution that we've experienced. Um, you know, we, we spend far too much time looking at computer screens, but, 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 uh, gosh, how much we can actually glean from that. Uh, and, and the we're all being taught to think laterally in different ways you know we're, we're, our wiring has changed be, because of that you know and we want we want instant gratification you know if you find the facts out at 10 o'clock you want to find the next bit at 11 o'clock you don't write a letter and expect a reply in two months time so we're all on a kind of speed dating kind of <laughs> kind of thing with, with with this subject but you know uh, so we weren't looking back i think you know if i go back so 30 40 years when i was a sort of student starting out I would have been surprised, both as a student or attending lectures, to have a series of lectures as diverse and different uh, and kind of uh, as uh, as colliding as these as these were, you know. Because we, we, it's a public lecture course, but we're not trying to tell the history of British art. We're not trying to suggest that's the canon or it's not the canon. And I think what I appreciate is the freedom that people have to explore and the respect that that people are willing to take on this stuff and, and to. Think about different methodologies, even though they may not be the way that that we ourselves think. We're very open. I think that one of the good things is we're very open to thinking of the possibilities of, of stories and narratives. And you know, I think there are. So to me, it's it's been you know it's, it's been sort of pushing boundaries back. We, we could, I suspect, you know, what question we didn't ask was, well, if you hadn't done that, what would you have talked about? <laughs> what, what would you have talked about? And, and I bet we've all come up with half a dozen things. You know, I could have talked about Thomas Buick, for example, who I, I really have a lot of time for. Um, and that's, that's an entirely different world. Um, you know, I mean, we have so many different ways and so many different, so it's a very kind of rich vein. And I, I would say this because I work for the Paul Mellon Centre in British Art. I think it's extraordinary uh, just how varied and diverse uh, the, the, the field has become mm. in the last 10, 15 years. Nika, could you tell us a bit about what your reflections are having with oversight over the series as a whole? Sure, I think um, a couple of different threads come to mind, I would say, <clears throat> excuse me. One of them is something that I think a few people have touched on tangentially, but about, uh, I was really struck that there was a simultaneous focus on these major iconic figures and then this resurrection of like, quote unquote, minor artists. And throughout, that's something that I've been thinking about. And it seems to me that one of the productive issues that brings to the table is not necessarily you know, sticking with those categories or reevaluating who should fall into which one, but instead it does seem to reflect a broader kind of interest in thinking through the figure of the artist in the stories that we tell. And I think this goes back to what um, Esther was saying about biography too. This seems to me actually very emblematic of our moment in art history more broadly of really thinking through how do we return artists to art history, but in a way that is more equitable and expansive and maybe illuminating and insightful than has been done in the past. Like this seems like a natural 
um, evolution from the post-structuralist turn. And so that's been, I think, just really fascinating to think about. And in some respects, I think that the parameters of the series to focus on or launch from a singular work of art kind of precipitates that question. Um, but I think it is really getting at something that is um, that people are thinking about a lot within art history, kind of within British studies, but beyond as well right now. Um, but I also wanted to respond to something that Paris said about whether or not the talks are using traditional methods or kind of pushing boundaries into new directions. And it reminded me of one of the questions that Nick got, I think Mark, you may have asked it, but about whether this you know, corpus of 500 drawings is somehow challenging the ability to produce a coherent interpretation. Um, and so I think to me, that's one of the kind of richest outcomes of this simultaneous exploration of like minor projects by major figures and major projects by minor figures is that it leads us to some of these limit points. Mm -hmm. In one reflection I've got that uh, will have struck maybe some of you watching and online and in person is, um, is that of the six speakers we've got, we've got, as it were, representatives of one, of a certain generation of scholars and curators, if I can say, describe both you, the two, the two Martins by my side, and I certainly include myself in this, who were trained uh, in the British system. And we have actually four speakers from the series, but all of whom have been trained in the States. And it's a really interesting thing, both, and that includes Esther, of course, as well, who did her PhD and a lot of her training at Yale uh, alongside Nick. And so it's really interesting to think about whether the ways in which this field has been transformed by the kinds of approaches taken not both at Yale, but also at places like Princeton, where Paris studied. You're, bit, you're as you said, you're an Americanist, um, Nika. So it's interesting to think about the way in which the field has been shaped and reshaped by the attention, the kind of the questions and the, the methods that are being promoted in the American university system rather than the British one. And what that tells us, I mean, it's interesting from us, our point of view as the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, founded by an American, of course, scholar, part of Yale University, but based here in London. And so in a sense, we've always been an Anglo-American institution, but it's interesting to think about the ways in which the, the field is shifting or has changed, thanks partly to uh, the emergence of a group of younger scholars, interestingly, coming through the American system rather than the British one. I wonder what that tells us. I'm not quite sure what it does, but it'd be interesting to hear people's reflections on that you know, bird's eye perspective on the shift in the field. I guess there's something to think about here about the, or something to consider here about the, the social and the kind of political environment in which the discipline is formed. Um, and harking back to that question which I think can be you know it is, it, I mean, it is a question about a focus on landscape as a in the 80s and 90s and again John Barrell and you know, um, Michael Rosenthal and David Solkin and so forth a number of really kind of key publications has opened up British art studies 18th century British art studies in a particular way and the way that retrospectively at least well no I think even at the time there's a sense that there were questions about class and property in Thatcher's Britain which helped shape that that intellectual work and that kind of intellectual project. Of course, America had a different kind of context, and maybe you can argue that that wasn't there. Um, I was in sort of thinking about this evening and what we were going to talk about. I had a look at um, uh, a review article that Douglas Fordham did in 2012, so it's now it's 10 years ago now, and he was sort of reviewing this civic humanist tradition and saying, well, actually, we need to be, move, move beyond that because the blind spots that there were. Uh, within that civic humanist focus, which is kind of you know focusing on, on notions of property and class and propriety, um, uh, which fitted with or which um, connected with uh, uh, political concerns in Britain in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. Um, and what he was pointing to there as well, you know, the blind spots are around empire, around slavery, around the global um, um, and uh, and state building. Mm -hmm. um, and you think, well, I think for Esther and Nick, I mean, Yale in the in the years after 2012 actually became kind of a hotbed for some of that thinking, which I think has sort of informed uh, informed the series as well. So that kind of that's that shift in what the 
political and kind of intellectual environment age which might be kind of driving those those points of emphasis or, or direction and i mean just to add to that martin that it's no coincidence that that turn to empire and the global and british art and particularly questions of race within british art has been driven from across the atlantic mm. um that perspective that the, the atlantic distance gives you on this question of empire is really crucial to that i think mm. No, I, I was also going to add, I mean, this is partially specifically um, for Nika, because I was really struck in, in her talk uh, that she was reflecting or sort of um, thinking about this painting both as a, maybe both as an Americanist, whatever that means, and as a British art specialist, whatever that means in this period, right? Um, because I think that was um, part of what was so fresh and exciting about that talk was sort of both thinking about how this, this particular work, Watson and the Shark, and I actually remember with my, you know, orals fields in graduate school, you know, there were paintings that I put on both my American art list and my British art list, and they function very differently in those two canons, what they mean in those canons, Benjamin West's uh, work being the other key example. And so I thought that was really interesting about how British art what British art means when it becomes open out to in maybe ways that hasn't always been to scholars trained in other kind of methodological preoccupation. Paris, Nika, do you want to respond to this, this these reflections around this shift? Yeah, Paris, maybe, first of all. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, actually, um, kind of where everyone is coming from as I was listening to the talks and the generational and the, you know, American educational background. Um, and I don't want to just repeat what Esther said, so I, I, I'm probably going to defer to her here. I think that the American perspective is really, really crucial for the empire conversation. Um, not that it wouldn't exist otherwise by any means, but I think that it, it, um, the distance of the Atlantic, as she said, allows for a type of reflection that um, has then been integrated in an incredibly interesting and fruitful way. I also, um, I was trained in a history department, which I think is another angle here um, by uh, by a historian who was trained in Britain. And so this cross, you know, Atlantic um, exchange goes in all of the directions, but it also certainly had me posing different questions, I think, than if I had been trained in an art history department or if I was doing my project um, under the alms of one. And I think that um, the cross-disciplinary aspect nevertheless, it was part of many, many people's talks. And I wonder about that as um, part of this moment as well, because- okay, Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, carry on. No, 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 that's that's plenty. Okay. Thoughts from Martin, mm -hmm. Nico, anyone um, else about this issue? Yeah, I, I'm just going back, you know, because I've got a reasonably long memory um, in terms of the history of art and, and training. I remember when I when I kind of got going in my 20s, there was always a kind of matching up between the artist and the art historian. So you were the Reynolds person, you were the so-and-so person, you know, you, as if you had this kind of right of ownership. Uh, and, you know, you, you were deferred to if that if you were the person. So who was the Lely person? Or who was, you know, well, you know, these days, it's kind of thankfully, that's, it's not really the case. E even if you're writing, as I am, or, or proposing to write a catalogue raisin there, you don't suddenly become the right person uh, or, or the wrong person. So there, there was this kind of ownership, and I think that that spilled out into all sorts of other interesting things about national culture and the ownership of objects and objects in private collections and who has the right to speak and walk the floor and enter the buildings and the collections. I spend a lot of time in private collections, and I really enjoy it uh, in many ways, but I realize I'm entering another stratosphere when I, when I do that. And the way in which you're allowed even now the license to speak and talk about certain things in certain places it's quite interesting that it's it's this kind of residual and i you know i think I mean, we can all think of david salkin and uh and richard wilson you know having the temerity to maybe offer 
slightly different view on the subject, be rapped on the knuckles uh, for doing so, perhaps because he himself was Canadian, or perhaps because he was saying things about a great national figure in British art. But he's absolutely fascinating as that narrative has unfolded since, what was it, 82, when, when David uh, did that show. So I think it's it's fascinating in a way it's, it's, it, that uh, the way in which it's kind of unfolded. And I think that we, uh, as I said, having kind of lived through it, it's fascinating how uh, we've kind of moved, moved beyond that. The, you know, the, the, the canon has grown because our attitude to the canon has changed. And, and I, I like to think that a lot of people who own pictures, who, who have that kind of right of, of, of ownership, are actually much more willing to countenance and listen to, because it's not going to hurt you. I mean, if somebody, you know, tells you something you might not want to know, except maybe that it's not as worth as much as you thought it was, uh, that always makes you go ouch. Um, but I think there's a there's a much, I, I would hope that there's a much freer flow uh, in that sense. But as I say, I public and private, uh, these are objects at the end of the day. They have places, they're in museums, they're in properties, you know. And, and you're still very fundamentally loyal to connoisseurship in some ways. I mean, that's what your talk in so many ways yeah, is about, I mean, wasn't it? I mean, it's about, we were talking about all these changes the discipline has, has, has gone through, but, you know, the focus on dating, a lot of focus on attribution mm. in the talk about, you know, who this mm. this picture might be by, who it might be of, mm. uh, dating. I mean, and, and that idea of, you know, that, that kind of attentiveness, that kind of visual comparison analysis mm. was right at the heart of your talk. And, in many ways, it's what's interesting is that you still very much believe that that kind of work is crucial and that it's not outmoded or it's it, no. I mean, in many ways, your talk was promoting, you know, a mode of thinking and yes. approach that's that I think so. maybe that's, hasn't had the tension. That, that's there. true. And I, I, you know, I, I don't think you just simply can chuck out the word empirical. Or you're an empiricist, so therefore you just gather information and have an idea afterwards. That's not the case because often you do have an idea, <laughs> and you, you're testing things out against. You know, but it was interesting talking to, uh, thinking about other people when you approach something. So Esther, when you're, you came across these portraits, they're not well known. So you had to forge a path through. And, you'll have, and, and obviously things did happen as you did your research. I, I suspect you didn't know when you started out that they were hung at the RA right next to the field of Waterloo by JMW Turner. But when you did, you thought, hmm. <laughs> That's worth thinking yeah. about. And, and just to say that, you know, that's what I mean by this absolute need to bridge, bridge, bridge the empirical. And we need to hang on, you know, that mm. work of new catalogue resume that rethink dates, you know, without that kind of base of information, then um, although I also believe that there's lots that can be done and should be done just, you know, just because we don't have archives and we don't have facts in a traditional way doesn't mean that certain stories should just not be done because they don't conform to certain kinds of traditional methodology methodologies. But at the same time, I really believe that that empirical, quote unquote, empirical work, for want of a better term, is absolutely fundamental and has to be fought for and, and done at the same time that we can do this other, you know, more speculative um, work. Um, I really, really think that. And just picking up on something that you said, Martin, um, about the kind of inclusivity or kind of broadness Catholicism of, of the field, um, that I would say, I don't know, I think I might speak for others when I say this um, in, in what we're classing as my, my generation. <laughs> um, but, you know, I definitely come from the history of British art and I'm interested in my own debts to the history of British art as a field and I'm very much located in that. But, um, you know, to be icon iconoclastic for a second, I also kind of don't care about defending Britishness. I care about where ideas of Britishness come from, but I'm not bothered about defending a kind and delimiting delimiting a field that is called British art and I think yeah. that's a big difference I think it's important oh. I was chatting the other just very briefly I was chatting the other night about Johann Zoffany and we were talking I was telling people a little bit about the history of the appreciation or the understanding of Zoffany and it's extraordinary way into the 20th century and it goes right away from when he first arrived in England right in the late uh, uh, in 20th century he's kind of not one of us as if it matters He's not born and bred. He's not Reynolds. He's not Gainsborough. And then the other thing is, which is I still find shocking. Well, he's kind of Jewish as well. He wasn't. He was Roman Catholic. But it goes on and on and on. It goes through and through. And you find 
uh, critic after critic after writer just chucking this stuff in because if that's a way as a sort of way of explaining you know and Waterhouse said well you know and I have a lot of time for Waterhouse great scholar but you know someone like said well all those things he would kind of iterate and say well he's kind of fundamentally lazy <laughs> intellectually lazy which I found extraordinary the fact you can throw those things out because you're educated within a British kind of way of thinking and the British system Nika, I think Nika, because yeah, your your take on all of this from your perspective, as you said, as an American, it's so very interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I I want to just kind of pick up actually on a couple of things that Esther was saying. So, you know, the first about um, kind of not not feeling a loyalty to upholding any kind of idea of British art, but interrogating that very category, I think is something that is um, thankfully kind of endemic within the field of American art right now too. And so the this idea that it's no accident that this um, approach to empire um, comes out of kind of US training, I think can be extended to say that it's also no accident that it's happening um, in the US right now. And that's because there is such an interest in thinking about a more, a broader conception of the Americas that extends well beyond the continental United States and really encompasses, you know, two full um, continents. And so I think that is a lot of what is kind of drawing, um, if I may make a huge generalization, what is it like contributing to the growth and in interest in what we might call British art studies in the US is the fact that there seems to be room for redefining that into something like Atlantic studies so that it's neither about British art or American art, but it's really about the political and economic circumstances that brought these regions into conversation. Thank you. I realize we're, we're, at this time, I want to certainly want to come to uh, questions from our audience and questions both here uh, and um, uh, from our online uh, audience too. But are there any other questions you wanted to ask of each other and of each other's papers or uh, of connections you've been interested in drawing between them um, uh, over uh, as you've been watching and listening uh, to them, uh, the talks over the, the past six weeks? Nick, how about starting with you? Well, <clears throat> I thought when, I mean, we, we've, we've already sort of touched on the kinds of um, sort of technological shifts, right, that have changed the way that we work. But I also found there was an interesting thread too about thinking as we, as we push against and, and, and sort of redefine what this moment in British art is, sort of how changes whether it's new discoveries or new acquisitions or lacunae or absences or transits, how, how museum collecting, right? And how public collecting has shaped the kinds of stories each of us told um, in our talks. I mean, it, with the case of, of my own talk on Romney, what's interesting is that actually most of his drawings are concentrated in a couple of different collections. So you can go to one place, whether that's the Fitzwilliam or the British Art Center in New Haven and see an enormous group of drawings together. And I think that actually changes the way people think about these drawings. They think about them as a kind of mass or as a kind of project, partially because they just happen to be in the same place. Um, so that's just one example, but I, I also thought, you know, again, um, Paris, with your talk, you know, both bringing in a, a work that's in the National Portrait Gallery, but then how you can, how do we fill the, the things that we don't know which ones they are or haven't yet entered into a kind of public consciousness. And again, with Nika, the fact that this, this, this painting that you're talking about is in the Americas and not in Britain and how reintegrating that story um, has something to do with collection. So that was my kind of broad question. I think yeah, I, I, I sort of echo and, and reinforce perhaps the, the point that Esther you brought up about the biographical and the way that that's filtered through um, most of the actually I think all all of the talks I mean to to, to a greater or lesser extent 
I sort of push it a little bit further, saying it's obviously it's because of the format that we have that we center on a case, we center on a single image. But from a single image, you could start talking about a genre. You could talk, start talking about a whole range of images, not frame it, not circumscribe it by life. Um, so I think there's something, there's some common ground here in the way that we are able to deal with a case and think about a biography, not as a limiting thing, but as something which actually allows us to understand a position or a, a, a kind of positionality which a work might take in relation to a whole set of circumstances which, which we understand better now than we did 10, 20, 30 years ago in terms of print culture, in terms of exhibitions culture, all those sort of structural things about what the Georgian art world or the late 18th century art world looks like. That work has sort of been done, so we have a foundation to move towards the case. Um, having said that, I'm also looking at the series and thinking about you know the kind of work which is happening at the moment. Clearly, there's a focus on the global, and that sort of drives. But there's also thinking, well, how do we get beyond the case, and how do we how do we start telling bigger stories again? Um, and the diversity which this series represents, and which we see in the field, is clearly to be celebrated because it means we're going in lots of different directions. But then you also think, well, is there a moment when we need to step back and say, well, you know, what, what holds this stuff together, and, and what are the big things which which form the common ground? Yeah, what would the textbook, the history of mm -hmm. British art in the long 18th century. What would that textbook be? Is an interesting if it yeah, came, position. If it's still the right out of the yeah, swamp. absolutely. And would it be? Would it have to be multi-author? Um, it's not an Ellis Waterhouse kind of history of painting in Britain, and um, or even a David Salkin um, history of British art. Maybe. Um, mm. What is that textbook that we want to give as a primer to, to undergraduate students? Mm. Well, and I think that returns to something which occurred to me when I was hearing you, Martin, talk about that question of ownership or gatekeeping, that we've moved on a great deal. And I think part of that is to do with <laughs> exhibitions and museums and galleries as well, that they've they've given British art a presence and the sense of ownership is now very dispersed, that lots of people feel that they have a stake in whatever British art is. I mean, British art perhaps is in some ways less of an issue than it was in 2012 or even in the early 2000s when Take Britain was founded. And there's a lot of discussion about that. We sort of got beyond that. And we have a lot of contested and diverse claims as to what British art might be. And they're allowed to sort of sit and jostle together. So maybe maybe there isn't the text to be text, textbook to be written because of the of the variety of claims and investments that, that the field of British art as a whole um, can accommodate. At this moment. I realise that we're coming, like, coming up to seven o'clock, so we've got um, a bit of time now for, I've got some more questions I'd like to ask you. There's one question I really want to ask you all, but um, we can um, now uh, turn to my colleague uh, Esme, who might be able to pass on any questions that we've received from our online audience, but also to invite questions from you here in the room. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Esme. Is, has there anything come through uh, from our online audience? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. So the first one is from David Salkin. Um, so in 2004, the late Angela Rosenthal published one of the first interventions into British art history that seriously attempted to bring race into the picture. I'm referring to our art history article entitled Visceral Culture and the Legibility of Whiteness in 18th Century British Portraiture. While listening to the talks in the series, I was struck by both, both by the obvious uh, potential relevance of Rosenthal's arguments to many, even uh, maybe even all of the images that were presented, and by the fact that none of the speakers took up the challenge to address whiteness as a pertinent issue. So this leads me into, uh, to a double-sided question that I'd like to address to everyone on the panel. Why do you think Rosenthal's uh, sorry, important provocation seems to have fallen into oblivion? And if you can recall, recall the thrust of her essay, are there ways in which you think that her work um, might enrich the readings that you have offered? Um, I think Nika should should kick us off on that one because I know this is very dear to, to, to the heart of your work. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think it's a really important one and I completely see what you mean about the article's relevance to the various talks throughout the series. I have um kind of a two-part response maybe one related to my own work and then one kind of speaking for the field if I may um so in terms of my own work um that article was absolutely pivotal as I was thinking about Copley's early portraits which I argue are in fact about whiteness looking at different factors um than Angela had considered but kind of very much informed by her work on British portraiture 
Um, and I think one of the things that I was really focusing on in this talk was trying to understand the presence of this Black figure. Um, but within the chapter that comes from this talk, I will definitely then be pursuing this thread of the way in which that figure's Blackness is inseparable from the whiteness of the other figures. And um, Jeff Quilly has written on that in relation to Watson and the shark as well. Um, but um, but yeah, it's definitely something that I'll be parsing out kind of in the next iteration of the project. But I think as far as why her take may be, um, I wouldn't say marginalized, but maybe like sitting quietly at the moment is because while it was such a critical first step in understanding the role of race in British art kind of globally understood that there has been a uh, important and I think necessary shift to trying to resurrect stories that are both by Black authors and of Black subjects, and that um, we could probably sit around kind of calling out the whiteness of many of these works of art and artists for a long time, but that in order to truly revolutionize the canon and make it more equitable, make it more diverse, we need to shed comparable, if not more light, on the stories of Black actors um, within the history. That would be, that's the guess that I would venture as to why maybe it doesn't play as large a role at the moment. Thanks very much, Nika. Any other responses from anyone else or does that encapsulate people's thoughts more generally? I, mean, I think, well, I would echo what Nika says wholeheartedly. I think also, you know, what, what it's an article I always teach to my students. And I think that um, actually it was sort of under the surface of my talk, not, the questions of race, but the way that Rosenthal speaks about visceral culture and, and thinks about the corporeal in the visual field. And I think that article has also, I think whether it's a directly, whether the analysis is directly uh, related to race or not, has also opened up different ways of thinking about um, portraiture and the figure um, and how it signifies. Mm -hmm. So it's such a, it's a really important intervention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it is a, a very significant issue. I just want to mention, obviously, with reference to Wright of Derby, I, I didn't talk about whiteness or blackness in my talk. But in terms of Wright's studies, there has been a very interesting shift. And I think one of the key moments in the last 10, 15 years was an exhibition at Liverpool, Wright of Derby in Liverpool, where the issue of race became right to the fore, not just for the, not in terms of, the depiction of black people, but the slave trade itself and how it invested the people who were buying pictures were, and not just in Liverpool. I mean, it's, it runs as a very strong mark thread through right of Derby's, and I'm busy cataloging his portraits at the moment. And it, it's, it's terribly important to get to grips with that because I'm doing a lot of biography at the moment. Who knew who, who's related to who, and it just comes up time and time and time again. And I think if we were going back, and I look back to, to you know, even 15, 20 years ago, I don't think there would be issues that people would really be, they might mention it in passing, they might say as a fact, oh, so-and-so was trading in this, so-and-so was trading in that. But it's not ingrained. And it's interesting to see now if you go to, there's a debate at the, the, the moment I, I notice in, uh, in Liverpool about one particular portrait uh, of uh, one of Wright's sitters, one of the first people he painted, who was a very wealthy uh, Liverpool merchant and there's a very provocative label in the gallery asking people should this work of by Joseph Wright remain on view I think it should I think it's very important that works like that remain on view and those questions are asked but I think that that's not the sort of thing that, that would even have been broached mm -hmm. uh, five or six years ago Thank you. Any other, any other questions, Esme? Yeah, I just have one more from Ian um, Guy. Um, so Ian says, where does concern for the Anthropocene fit into current 18th century British art? Hmm. <laughs> yes, Nick, maybe we will turn. Yeah, well, I think I might have disappointed uh, Martin when I said what I would talk about because that I, I work on landscape and ecology, <laughs> and I refused to talk about that for whatever reason. Um, I think it's absolutely crucial, and I and I think uh, 
Um, I think we could say, I'm just running through it. I think all of the talks from, to, from the series are absolutely um, speaking to the, the ways in which we're rethinking the history of capitalism, rethinking the history of empire, rethinking the history of um, the racialization of bodies. All of this is, is intimately and inextric inextricably um, connected to um, the period that we could call the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene um, or any other number of labels. But uh, I think that um, part of what we're doing here in, in shifting away from a, sort of a traditional idea of a national boundary is, is thinking about question, I mean, what you were just bringing up about uh, investments in the slave trade, for example, Martin, how, how part of what <clears throat> the Anthropocene story is, is also about insisting on the interconnectivity of, you know, British subjects or British artists or British people to other histories of, of, of environmental um, extraction um, and of the kinds of remaking or terraforming of the world that, that really accelerated in the late 18th century. So the moment we're looking at. Um, so I think it was, it was there, if not articulated in a lot of the talks. I mean, I'd also just remark that um, although we've all been indebted to say the digital turn and the kinds of new technologies that um, have generated a material turn in this discipline, there wasn't a talk that really focused on materials and materiality, you know, as its primary raison d'etre. And that is, that's a huge part of British art studies right now. So that, that was non-representative, I would say. And that clearly connects to questions of um, extracted resources and so on. So that's there, but not represented by the, the spectrum of talks in the series. Any questions from here in uh, in the in the in the room uh, that you'd like to address uh, to the panel, or again questions that the panel would like to address to each other? Uh, any questions that uh, have come out from either individual talks from the series or reflections on the series as a whole? We'd love to hear any uh, reflections or responses from you all. Yes, I have one question. If you just wait for the mic. One question. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, I wanted to get back oh, slightly away from the historiography, back to the to the art and the history itself. Uh, and in particular, I want to think about, or to raise the subject of the artist and his, and they're all been his and her, um, geographic and intellectual hinterlands at the time. And I'm thinking particularly of Joseph Wright of Derby. Derby then being uh, one of the newer major industrial towns in the UK, and also the spin-off branch of the original Litchfield Lunar Society. And I believe that, I don't think that uh, Wright was actually a member of that, but he was closely related. And I think he was a friend or of a new Rasmus Darwin and people like that. And I wonder if w him working in that environment, how that influenced uh, a, what he, well, it clearly influenced what he paid because he's not a paid, He's a painter, literally, of the Enlightenment in place in paintings like the Orrery and the uh, uh, the experiment of the air pump. But uh, generally, how does working in a period when almost everything you held um, true was actually changing, almost on a weekly, daily basis, how did that influence him? Do you think, and how does that apply to the other artists, their geographic areas where they were working? Okay. That's a big, broad question. It's a big, broad realize. question. But and yeah. final one on that. Why is David... Let's, why hold, is, let's hold on to that. No, no, this is a simple one. It's very related. Why is Joseph Wright of Derby rather than any other artist of that? Yeah. Why geography? But, Clearly important. But, yeah, because he was known as Joseph Wright of Derby at the time. You know, he was identified very much with, with Derby itself. And he worked out of Derby and through Derby. And yes, he did come to London. He trained in London, as we talked about it. But you're absolutely right. Uh, his hinterland, Darby, the lunar, he wasn't a member of the Lunar Society, as we know, but he knew them all very well, and Erasmus Darwin was a close friend, he painted his portrait, uh, several versions, throughout the you know, 1770s and then again in the 1790s. These people were absolutely uh, part of his intellectual and social uh, universe. And they were at the heart of it. And they wouldn't have seen themselves as peripheral. That's the other thing. Yeah. They were not regional by any stretch of the imagination. And the, the same things that were happening in other areas, book clubs, societies, meetings, you know, uh, 
uh, they were very much at the hub of it uh, and the Midlands, the, the, the rights world, although he did travel. I mean, they're interesting. I mentioned he went to Liverpool, you know, but one of the first things he did when he first started get going as an artist was visit all these small regional towns. So he goes to Retford, he goes to, you know, he goes to Macclesfield, he goes here and he paints all of the, the you know, the people who can afford it in all those places. And when you start to put that network together, it's a bit like going back to the other thing I was talking about. It's an absolutely extraordinary uh, network. So he is, regionality is, is, is hugely important uh, for Joseph White. Um, that question, Martin, did you want to talk a bit about that, this, about region, about the, the local and, the, and, and about networks of the local and whether the digitization of resources uh, and research has allowed even your own work, not necessarily expressed in the yeah. series, but in relation to like the students of the Royal Academy, their own, their particular networks of patrons, of masters, of streets in which they live. Yeah. But there's a kind of an upsurge of very local and uh, 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 research. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I think I think I almost not a counterpoint, but can I compliment really to the global turn mm. in British art history is that we can also localize in an incredibly kind of detailed way, you know, from our desktops often. And I think that perhaps that's one of the things which is playing out in this series is that there is an expanded perspective on British art, which may be. Atlantic and maybe global, but then also that sense of the case, the biographically framed case, but but but, but the case is a, a moment, an instant, a moment of exhibition, a moment of encounter comes through very forcibly as well. And yeah, absolutely the case that um, digitization of newspapers and how accessible they are, we, we know what you can we can put in um, a name or an artwork's name or a date, and we can just explore across such an array of material. Um, um, and that material is not just about London, it's not just about the things which have been captured by historians before, it's uh, a, a very kind of immediate access to a massive raw material, and I feel like when Paris obviously has kind of been working with large data, and you know, I've done a bit of this myself, and it's almost like there's, there's so much stuff there, there is a question going forward, well how do we actually manage this, and what do we do with it, how do we process all the stuff that we can find, I mean for you Martin now, in do, doing a catalogue raisonne, the, the materials that you can access in terms of commentary and newspaper commentary and even kind of um, sales histories as well, the access to sales catalogues that we have digitally, as well as in libraries and archives. Um, yeah, the, it, it is present new issues, which I don't think we've really worked through yet. I mean, what do we do when we have this much information at hand? It does potentially shift the, shift the geographical agenda. It does allow us to see a British art world, which is you know, happening in Philadelphia and in New York and in Leicester as well as in London. Mm. Paris, did you want to say a word or two about this um, this issue, both about the kind of mass data and then also the how you can become incredibly specific about networks and locales of some of the artists you've been working with, for instance? Yeah, I would love to. And if you don't mind, I want to first address the question from the audience about geography. Um, and connect it to what we were talking before about Britishness. Because I think that um, I was linked to what Martin was saying about, you know, Zophany and these aspersions. But I think it has a lot, it has to do with a lot more than where someone was born. Um, Eliza Trotter, who I talked about, was Irish. But when we look um, earlier in the 18th, and we don't know, there's no real commentary on her geography or Britishness or not. But in the mid 18th century, we have two women who are incredibly prominent in London, Angelica Kaufman and Catherine Reed, neither of whom was English. Kaufman was Swiss, Reed was Scottish. And in the press, they're both completely subsumed under the banner of Britannia. They're celebrated for their Britishness. Kaufman is one of um, Richard Samuel's nine living muses of Britain. Reed is referred to as the English Rosalba. And so it, it just transcends place of birth in geographic locality in these really interesting ways that I think have to do with national pride at the time as much as anything else and reception ever since. Um, because Angelica Kaufman is often still celebrated as British and she was not in any way. She in fact lived in the capital for you know the minority of her life. She came to England in 67 or 68 and left in 81. Um, and yet she's taken on this nationalistic identity. And so I think that's really important to reflect on and to think about how people were regarded at the time and the ways that that's inflected these mythologies that have to do with geography and um, nationalism as much as anything else. 
And then in terms of data, I, I completely agree with what Martin said. It's There's almost an overwhelming amount once you start getting into what exists and what one can do with current technology. And what does one do with that? It certainly um, disseminates these, these geographic focal points because you can, um, I mean, you can just explode and expand what you're looking at so quickly. And the data actually demands that you do that. It both in terms of, you know, London as a place of artistic production, it reinforces and challenges it all at once. Um, but what's in, you know, one of the most interesting things is your question mark, which is what are the specific networks that helps you identify? And it's, it's remarkable what you can find through, you know, my own example would be exhibition catalogs, but really, you know, any source from the time. And because what we have in exhibition catalogs, let's say are artist addresses um, from the earlier exhibition catalogs before the Royal Academy, you often have um, artists who are living with other artists or other exhibitors. And so you can start to identify who's working with whom, who knows whom, who's supporting whom. Um, and you end up with this incredibly intricate art world where you can even see, you know, one year someone else has entered it and then they're living with someone for a while and then they're down the street from each other. And this isn't, I, this isn't work that I've spent the majority of my time on, but the hints of it are just unbelievably promising for really unpacking what's going on on a minute scale, again, even without so many of the sources that we would normally rely upon surviving. Um, and it's hard to know what to do with all the data and it's hard to even be the, you know, even compile it. But I really believe strongly that it offers so much potential for accessing worlds that are otherwise really seem to be beyond the horizon. And a quick plug, the PMC tomorrow is hosting a, uh, an online uh, a conference devoted to this idea of mass data and what we do and how it's transforming uh, research into British art. Any other questions? Thank you for your question. Any other questions uh, from the floor here or from our online audience before we bring it to a close? Edmund? Um I, yeah, I have one more question from Catherine. So she says, thank you for such a fascinating conversation. Um, so I think this is addressed to everyone. So if you could just, if you could add just one additional work to the series, what would it be and why? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm not going to say an individual work, but I will just, you know, fly the flag for print. And mm. we haven't really had a print, have we, that's mm. been the focus, but in my opinion, um, and something that I'm working on as a, 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 another project is the absolute centrality of the print medium to this period. It completely can't be understood without it. And it's not only a place where British art is reproduced and disseminated and commercialized, but it's also a site of great artistic experimentation. So that's missing, I think, in terms of media. Good, good call, Esther. <laughs> I, I have great sympathy with that. So. Yeah, I, I really would back that up. And I did mention Thomas Buick earlier, but uh, <laughs> Buick is an extraordinary man and the print. Also, in terms of regionality, um, you know, I, I think he, if, if I had to sort of pick another person, another artist, another thing, um, it would be Buick. Because mm. I, I think, you know. Buick uh, from? Mm -hmm. Thomas Buick of well, Newcastle. Well, Newcastle well, actually, says. <laughs> yeah, his workshop was in Newcastle, but he, he lived down the Tyne Valley, but let's not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay. let's hear it for Thomas Buick. So Martin's nomination. Nika, what about you? Which work would you choose to add to our, pan the, our mini pantheon of, of individual choices? Well, let's see. I think I have one that would maybe satisfy Esther's desire for print. Um, I was thinking of someone like Scipio Moorhead and the print that he had done of Phyllis Wheatley. I think something that maybe speaks to the way in which um, kind of a person of color was maybe gravitating towards uh, also minor medium in order to reframe some of the ideas about portraiture, for example, that were in circulation at the time would be really interesting to think about. Any other nominations? I think I would nominate, it's, and it's incredibly obvious, Turner. But I would nominate Turner because of the way Turner's name and his art and his self-portrait and 
the image of the slave ship in particular have been mobilized so often in order to kind of reclaim a late Georgian British art history as a kind of positive contribution to, to British cultural identity. And we, sort of, we, we can tell good stories which, which seem to connect the current concerns, but there are also limitations to that story as well. And I think revisiting that and thinking about a, a figure who is genuinely iconic within British culture, who we reclaim in very positive ways, but we need to keep under scrutiny in order to make sure that we don't just, that we don't end up kind of recirculating complacent views as well. I mean, the way in which Turner's name is being involved with kind of claims about abolition and his own position are worth keeping in keeping in view. I would add, I would also I would add a print, but I would add I work, you know, one of the things that I work on is sort of meteorological diagrams and scientific images. So I also think it could have been interesting to throw into the mix um, an object that is not a, a work of art. Can I just make say one more thing I think is important to be said here, which is that we've we've conveyed quite uh, where we've been thinking about British art and the global in this series, we've conveyed quite an Atlantic view of things. And there is, of course, really important work happening in the Pacific, in British India. And I would want to see, and it wouldn't be me that would do this work, but I would want to see someone like Holly Schaefer um, speaking about company painting or um, artworks created in the Indian context, for example, and, 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 and broaden our views eastwards as well as westwards. Great, thank you. Oh, we have, uh, oh, sorry, Paris? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I was just gonna say that I would actually do a work that Martin Mayrone included in his talk, but um, didn't spend a ton of time on, which is a print. And it's the print of Mariah Cosway. It's satirical at her easel called Maria Costive. And she's in a bedlam cell. cell. She's been jailed because she's been painting works that are too fusely in, in influence. And I think it's a fantastic commentary on, you know, you can talk about history painting and portraiture, you can talk about, you know, the role of the imagination and a lot of the gender issues that emerge around concepts of genius and um, the imaginary. And you can also talk about a lot of um, the prison issues that came up in Nick's talk, um, which then of course connects to Mary Wollstonecraft and a lot of what she's writing at the time. And I think it really would open a fantastic world and other, you know, Georgian Publications 3 is already taking shape, I can see. Uh, can I ask one last question, maybe, um, if I could? Uh, can I just ask you to, ref all of you, to reflect on how you write and about whether the form and structure and the rhetoric of your writing, you feel that you're being experimental with, that that's changed, that the way and mode of writing, the language you use, the approaches you take, are you being very, if you look back across the series, look back at your own writing, does it follow a kind of classic scholarly formula for addressing an individual work of art? Do you feel any of you took a wildly different approach to how one would go about the work of interpreting or opening out a work of art than has been conventional? Or do you feel that we should, you know, I just be interested to think about modes of writing, of art writing uh, on, on all of your cases and whether you feel very self-conscious or conscious about how you go about writing uh, your pieces? I mean, I, I, I can, there's a, there's a kind of descriptive answer, but it opens up things a little bit more, which is when it comes to, you know, preparing a lecture, preparing a talk, um, I don't write initially, I struggle to write, and then I realise, actually, I need to get my slides in order. So I curate, I end up doing the slides first, and then writing, then actually they're, they're, they're putting, putting the images in sequence, and yeah, curating that, that what is after a kind of temporal kind of experience of, of putting slides in order. And that's also when you start, I mean, we've touched a number of times about digital, the digital world and how easily now, I mean, remember going to kind of slide libraries and finding, you know, digging your slides out, how now, you know, just before the talk, you go, oh, actually, I missed, I missed an image out. You can put that in. So that kind of digital economy that we're in and what it allows us to do is to move images around and to grasp images which are often not iconic or not familiar or not part of the canon and um, mobilize them um, uh, and put them in association with one another. So that's the, you know, it, it is a visual medium and PowerPoint mm. allows us to, 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 do, to do art history as a, as a visual medium. <laughs> And I, I mean, I think to that point, one of, I think it's always, I think one always ends up writing better things that are eventually published if they were first written to be spoken. Um, and it's partially about tone, but it's also what you were saying, Martin, about 
the, the staying as close as possible to the object and to the image and sort of, um, you know, you can get into a lecture and then you're reading it back and you're like, what am I going to put on screen now? And then you think maybe I just won't talk about that because it, it, you're telling a story with images. It's not just the text. And so for me, I was trying to stay as close as possible to these drawings of which there were just, you know, I, I talked about maybe 10 of 500. Um, and, and so I think that's what what the especially a public lecture um, offers is that 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 sense that you want to stay as close as possible to what what is what is the visual what is the object uh online uh, panelists paris nika any thoughts about your writing and your mode of writing yeah i mean i would definitely echo what nick was saying that um a piece of writing that emerges from a talk is just always so elegantly interwoven with the objects themselves. And um, I have not in the talk that I gave uh, as part of Georgian provocations, but in another piece of writing um, that I did relatively recently, a couple of years ago, I did decide to get very experimental. I felt, well, at that point, the dissertation was long done, the book was coming down the pike, and let me just try something new. Because one of the things that I had um, really responded to in a colleague's work, who does art history, but was trained as a historian, was just the incredible richness of storytelling in her work. And it felt like she was building entire worlds. Um, and I thought, let me see if that is possible, if it is necessary for the work that I was doing, I will say on Copley's portraits. And I wrote an entire article using that kind of approach and methodology. And I felt really good about it uh, at the time. And then I went back to it months later. And I thought this just is not necessary for what I want to say about these paintings. And it was a really helpful experiment. I will say that the editor to whom I submitted this article very much agreed with me that a lot could be taken out. Um, but I'm happy for having done the experiment. It really taught me that the that art historical writing isn't just about kind of repeating conventions but is intimately tied to the kinds of arguments and interventions and claims that we want to make thank you paris did you want to add your thoughts on this yeah i um First of all, of course, echo what everyone says. I think that when talk, when writing comes out of a talk versus the other way around, it's so it's always so much more dynamic. Um, that wasn't my path with this talk um, because this was so rooted in the book, which had been the dissertation, and feels deeply academic in a way that I in that that is just permanent to it in a certain way. But I will say with an, my more recent project, which I started about a year ago. Um, I tried to write in a new way and it was more creative and more experimental. And like Nika said, it was so much fun. Um, it was a different way of doing it and it's for a different audience. It was not for an academic audience. And it's something that now I'm playing with um, as I'm putting it in a more, um, a tighter form and into chapter form, how to meld that with academic writing and with end notes and whatnot. And it's a challenge, but I think it's a really fun and rewarding one. And I'm hopeful that that is something that can actually work as a way forward. Um, and it would be interesting to do a talk um, that was an experiment in writing, right? In Georgian Provocations 3 or whatnot, <laughs> you know, um, and have that be part of it. I think, mm -hmm. I think it could lead to a really interesting conversation of how we tell the stories we do um, and why. Any other thoughts on? modes of writing. I, I just realized we're, we're hitting time and I, I know that we um, we did we are supposed to finish at half so I know we could carry on uh, having a conversation or leaving but can I just thank, can I ask all of you to thank our panelists for a fantastic contributions both from the States and from here in Bedford Square. So many, many thanks to all of you. So I can ask the audience to thank our panelists.
Thanks so much, Paris. Thanks so much, Nika. Thanks for all of you watching online. Uh, it's been great to have you with us, uh, not only tonight, but throughout the series as a whole. There may be a Georgian Provocation 3 coming down the line, but we'll have to see. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks everyone very much. And all of those of you here, here in Bedford Square, can I invite you to uh, a drink next door with us and where we can carry on our conversations uh, in a more relaxed and informal way. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thanks, Matt.